and drive. Now, did the punishment fit the crime? Probably not. In January of 2003, Razkaz was convicted of a DUI and sentenced to nine months in prison. Razkaz is, is a fascinating example of rappers who've been affected by the prison industrial complex. Here's a guy who could make references to the Venus of Willendorf and talk about ancient esoteric philosophy from Africa as bright, as well-read as he was. And knowing good and well he had two strikes against him, ended up being in prison for drunk driving. And so we see how vulnerable so many people are to this. The judge looked at my record. My name was like, Mr. Austin, you don't have respect for the law. You need to go somewhere for a while. Rather than remand himself to the California Department of Corrections to begin serving his sentence, Razkaz became a fugitive from justice. Before I had a, a case, I still hadn't had an album out in three years. So how the fuck was I feeding my kids? I felt that I hadn't had the fair opportunity to level playing field to work for the past three years. I figured, what the fuck am I going to lose for another two? I better make the money now instead of wait for these people who are going to let my children starve. Because when you go in there and then they force you to work and they give you six cent, you know, an hour, you can barely even feed yourself. You know what I'm saying? It's a setup. It's slavery. The state of California had to wait a little bit longer, so be it. If I had to serve a little more time in jail, then so be it. While on the run, he recovered the masters of his unreleased albums from Priority Records. He then gave himself up and was jailed with additional time added on. He was sentenced to two years. I've never been to prison. I mean, I was freaked out about that. Like, you know, all I know is the stories I hear and, you know, Oz watching the TV show. So I didn't know what to expect. If I get raped, I'm killing whoever does it, and then I'm never coming out of here. So I was afraid of certain things off back. The warden told us, I want you here. This is how I make my money. I don't want you reformed. I want you to come back. And I don't want you, I want, I want to make you miserable while you're here. The reality of prison is that it's not us. It's not us against them. It's not cops. It's not we're the good guys and they're all the bad guys. You know what I'm saying? It really ain't. There's shades of gray sometimes. People are just themselves and nine times out of 10, if you're not fucking with them, they're not gonna fuck with you. And that's just the truth of the matter. Now, I'm not a crip. I'm not a blood. I had a lot more disdain for people that get in this rap music industry coming out, acting like they are. All that shit that y'all see in the videos just for the video. <laughs> That's for MTV, it's to sell it to middle America. Rapper crip, rapper blood, you fake bitch ass niggas. It's people that can't wait to get out that would kill some of these rappers. While incarcerated, he released a mixtape titled Re-Up, which Priority Records unsuccessfully attempted to block. I actually said it in a rhyme. I said, I gained some wisdom. Fuck industry niggas. I get along better with niggas in the streets and in prison. Uh, what I learned is that prison is a microcosm of the world. Human beings tend to tell you the truth. It's industry, like corporate America, people that are like, it's the worst prison. It's like sick liars. People are lying to keep their job. People try to destroy people intentionally. Prison, if you do something, people kill you. That, I understood the rules there. It's corporate America where the rules change. I had to grow up, because the world won't. Some of these institutions win because people still refuse to do what the fuck God said, and that's love everybody. If you go to prison with your chest poked out, somebody gonna poke something in it. Don't put up with no bullshit, but don't be in there trying to act like you the craziest, hardest dude, because it's always somebody harder. So just be chilling, do your thing, work your program. Razkaz was released from prison in 2004. In 2007, after several years of litigation, he was able to successfully sever ties from Priority Records. He continues to record and release material on his own independent label, Re-Up Entertainment. The food is cold and the milk is hot. It's served on plastic trays. The dining experience is made as uncomfortable as possible as inmates are hustled through the line. Costing less than $3 per day per inmate, the quality and quantity of food can mean the difference between peace and violence in the cell blocks, where prisoners long for the sirloins and sundays that vanished with their freedom. Oh, man, the food is terrible. The food is nasty. The food is, like, totally fucked up. They got worms in there. A lot of that stuff be like rations from the, from the war and stuff. 
Only one that, that I know that think the food is good in jail is the crackheads. They ain't ate in eight, nine days, so anything you give them is just mm, lovely. The food they give you is just high in starch, high in salt. The meat is like, who knows what kind of meat it is. Food, it could be better. I mean, yeah, I eat food some days, you know, but I ain't gonna lie, some days you're gonna get some slop. I'm talking about some real slop. Like some watered down, like, stew. A couple chunks of potatoes, a little small piece of meat, and water. But it's, you gotta have something in, in your in your system. And you gotta have strength in case somebody tried to step to you. Some prisons but got chicken ranches. They got slaughterhouses in the back of the motherfuckers where they chopping up, they serving you ribs. Most of the inmates cook it, so who knows what's going on with the food. And I worked in the kitchen and watched how much food we were forced to waste. There's people going in there with their little bags, plastic bags, dumping their tray in their bag, tying, putting their chicken in there or whatever, tying it up, putting in their sock. And you don't have long to eat. It ain't like you at the Ritz. You know what I mean? You slide through that line, grab it, eat it, and you can't be sitting when everybody else is standing because that might get you some type of reprimand or whatever. There used to be, there was a saying, three hots in the cot. You don't get three hots in the cot. You, know, you get two hots and a sack lunch. And if you don't wake up in the morning, then you didn't get your lunch. So if you overslept and didn't make it to breakfast, so you're fucked. Some people just rather go to canteen and buy what they need to buy through commissary or canteen. It's a business. So we're going to give you barely enough to eat so you, if anybody does love you, we can get all your money. Meanwhile, the police chief, his daughter owns one of the catering things that brings the Snickers and all that, so they're charging you exorbitant fucking prices. Like, whatever price the stuff is on, in, the, in the supermarket, it's double and then add about two, three more dollars to it. That's how everything is on the commissary list. It's how they eating you up when they get you. A native of Vallejo, California, Jay Diggs won his first MC competition on the radio station 106.1 when he was 15 years old. Jay Diggs and rap legend Mac Dre grew up together and their friendship, which would be tested, proved to have no bounds. Jay Diggs represents Vallejo, California, Country Club Crash. I mean, it's my neighborhood where we at right now. Matter of fact, on Mark and Leonard, home of Mac Dre. Man, Mac Dre meant to me, man, uh, <laughs> everything, man. You know what I mean? He was my best friend. He was a mentor. He was my favorite rapper. You know what I mean? I idolized him, you know what I mean, a lot, man. You know what I mean? And, uh, and also, like, we grew up together. Me, myself, I was a young guy in the streets, you know what I mean? We always teenagers. So being a teenager, you know what I mean? I was into some everything. One of the things I happened to be in was bank robbery. Jay Diggs and his crew known as the Romper Room Gang, allegedly robbed more than 40 banks in and around the San Francisco Bay Area. You at that age, man, and you and you going in a bank and you come out and you got fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, you know, you're like, wow, that was easy. Two minutes. Hmm. I was so wild with it that one time I robbed a bank on Friday and I went back in there on Saturday and robbed the bank the next day, the same bank. Meanwhile, Mac Dre's first album was blowing up in the Bay, and he seemed to be on the cusp of national stardom. But his friendship with Jay Diggs would soon prove costly. And at this particular time, you know, I was going out to Fresno. You know, Dre wasn't even tripping. You know, he was doing some music in the studio. He was with me that morning. We was together, and we was about to leave and go out to Fresno, you know what I mean, to go do what we do. So we going, me, Dre, my little cousin, Kilo, and we had an informant with us. Little did we know we had FBI agents following us, and this dude had a wire on us. After getting to Fresno, Mac Dre rented a hotel room with a female companion while Jay Diggs and his cousin Kilo left for the bank heist. Now, Dre at the room, he got a girl, he not tripping, he don't got nothing to do with the bank robbery. The next morning to go, you know, do what we finna do, man, and we in the car, I'm by the bank, I'm about to hop out. My little cousin, like, man, hold up, man. Like, look at these cars, man. Got these little Fed cars. That's when it was the Aries cars. So me and my cousin, we both having the same vibe. Like, man, something ain't right. I'm like, man, you know, let's squash this shit. I go across the freeway and go across the middle and start going the other way. When I do that, man, it's like 20, 30 federal cars start peeling off. But they don't, they unmarked. Station wagons, trucks, Porsches, everything you can name peeling off the freeway behind us. They get a car on us, they jump out, guns everywhere, helicopter in the sky, the whole routine. So the ultimate charge was conspiracy to commit armed bank robbery. 
Jay Diggs was looking at a 10-year sentence, but was potentially facing more time for his previous crimes. They said we took substantial enough steps to make the robbery, so they charged me and my little cousin, Kilo Curtis. They charged us both with conspiracy and attempt bank robbery. And since Dre was with us and he was just at the room, they charged him with conspiracy. And they come to him saying, hey, listen, you tell us that them dudes was going to rob this bank, we, you can go home. We followed you. We know you weren't robbing no bank, but, but we know you knew they was going to rob a bank. So he could have easily, could have two seconds, it was nothing for him to say, hey, look, man, yeah, I, I know they was going to rob a bank, and yeah, I'll testify and say that they was going to do that. And he could have had his whole life back. But Mac Dre refused to cooperate with the DA's office and instead stood trial along with the rest of the Romper Room gang. It's a two-week trial. We got found guilty. Uh, Dre was given the maximum time you can get for conspiracy to commit armed bank robbery, which was five years. Kilo was given eight, and I was given 10 years. When I first got to the penitentiary compound, the first thing I did was I found out who was the dudes that was in charge on the compound, who was the dudes running the compound, you feel me? And I went and stepped to each one of them and let them know who I was and that I was a boss. My crew was, was highly respected. We didn't go in there on no bullshit. We was treated like real men, you know what I mean? We was young kids coming in. But before we got there, everybody pretty much knew how we was, you know what I mean? They knew we were some young dudes that was from the street. We had street savvy and we had business sense. Mac Dre, he had all the shit from the streets. He knocked the female guard, you know what I mean? He did shit that, you know what I mean? Only a boss can do in prison, man. So, you know, we, we, really, we really had some of, the, some of the luxuries in prison that most people didn't have, man, just because of the status that, that, we, that we carried and the way we carried it. You choose to do the wrong thing, then you got to know what the consequences is. Every action, there's a reaction. So if you out robbing banks, or if you out selling dope, if you out playing with guns, whatever you're doing, you got to say to yourself, OK, if I get away with this, what's going to happen? You might kill somebody, right? Now, if I get caught, what's going to happen? Everybody know the end result to killing somebody. You understand what I'm saying? Everybody know the end result to getting caught with guns, drugs, and so forth. So what I'm saying to you is, you got to take it upon yourself to make choices and you got to make decisions. And you got to ask yourself, man, if I make this wrong decision, what is it going to lead to? Now, I got a choice to make right now. My choice is my freedom right now. I don't want the pen again. You know what I mean? I did it. I did it like a man. Stand up. I always promote stop snitching. If you got to do your time, do it. But if you got a choice, man, stay out here on these streets is what I'm saying. It's not worth it, man. The penitentiaries is getting full, and they're not treating you with no kind of love in there, man. It's ugly in there. Would I ever want to do that shit again? Hell no, that was the worst time of my life. It was nothing like being in a motherfucking room this big and calling it your life. You feel me? I did 14 months in a, in a hole where my food was slid through the door, with mice jumping all up on my bed and shit. Nobody wants to go through that shit. It's not worth it. In 2002, Jay Diggs was released from prison. Waiting for him was an old friend. I came home and I was, I was stuck in the same situation I was before. But I had, you know what I mean, I, my mind was a little sharper this time, and then plus I had the help of Mac Dre, who was in the same position. He came home, and he had two choices, either this music or the streets, and he chose music. So he paved the way for me. Jay Diggs' album, Both Sides of the Gate, was released 11 years to the date of his arrest, which he dubs a rebirth. Man, if I didn't have this music, boy, the streets would be in trouble. <laughs> you know, banks would be in trouble. Y'all think this shit a game? It ain't no game, man. I don't play. Now, anybody know me, bro, know I don't play, bro. If I didn't have this music, bro, chances is I'd be up to something. I'd be one of California's worst things going, for real. On November 1st, 2004, Mac Dre was gunned down in his car while returning to his hotel after a concert in Kansas City. I was actually laying in the bed, and I got a phone call at 6 o'clock in the morning. I don't get phone calls early in the morning from this dude right here. But when he called me and when I heard it in his voice, I knew it wasn't no joke, man. It was for real. And Dre taught me so much, man. We used to talk so much, because we really lived together, you know what I mean? We was living together at the time it happened. But the best advice he probably gave me was not to let the neighborhood hold me down. You would get stuck, man. You got to get up and get out of here. It's the only way you can make shit happen. And now anybody know me, you know you find Diggs all over the country, you know what I mean? Jay Diggs is now the president of Fizz Entertainment and continues to preserve the memory of Mac Dre. Race relations in prisons are dreadful. In some prisons, race is everything. 